Remember when Europe looked like this? It was the start of lockdowns in March, and at the time, WHO was sending this message. We don't generally recommend the wearing of masks in public. Then in April, they started telling us this. Countries could consider using masks. In By June, they'd made an almost complete 180. WHO advises that governments should encourage the general public to wear masks. WHO prides itself on relying on scientific data. It's supposed to help us separate fact from fiction. So, why the constantly shifting messages? Because scientific findings change all the time. For instance, before the 1950s, smoking was advertised as healthy. Now, we know that that's not true. Why is that? Why do scientific findings keep changing? Let's go back to 1928. Pretend you're the Scottish biologist Alexander Fleming. In 17 years, you're going to win the Nobel Prize for discovering penicillin. But right now, you're staring at a petri dish, confused, wondering why bacteria isn't growing in it when it should be. The dish has mold in it, but it also has everything bacteria needs to thrive. The right temperature, the right nutrients, but no bacteria. Why? To answer that, you follow the same process that scientists before you have followed and scientists after you will follow. The scientific method. Make an observation, ask a question, form a hypothesis that you can test, make a prediction based on the hypothesis, test your prediction, make your conclusions. Let's go through each of these steps, shall we? All scientific processes start with an observation. Apple falls from tree. Water in a bathtub rises when you go in it. Prism turns sunlight into a rainbow. Next, you ask why. Why won't bacteria grow in a plate full of mold? You start your background research. What is already known about what you're asking? How can that help answer questions about what isn't known? This helps you make a reasonable assumption about what might be going on. A hypothesis. For instance, the bacteria isn't growing because something in the dish might be discouraging it. The only thing that's in the dish, besides all the stuff that's good for bacteria, is the mold. So, is mold stopping the bacteria? What is it about that mold? How is it doing that? And how are you going to prove that this is what's happening? Well, you experiment. Fleming made what he called mold juice. He isolated the mold and grew it. He tested it on many different types of bacteria and found that when the mold was around, some bacteria stopped growing. So what did that prove? That the mold releases a substance that stops the growth of certain bacteria. Eureka! Penicillin. Our first antibiotic. For the first time ever, a wound doesn't immediately mean death from infection. At least 200 million lives saved. What next? Well, early scientists would have written letters about their findings to their other scientist friends. The friends would reply with questions or comments. At the end of it all, you'd reach some kind of agreement that what you've learned is actually true. Today, you've got journals. Once you've proven something through experiments, you write up what you found and how you found it. A journal might publish your work, so other scientists can learn, discuss, or even debunk your findings. The most basic criterion is that the conclusions are not overstretched, that the results are not overinterpreted. Dr. Skipper heads Nature, one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world. Out of 200 papers submitted to the journal every week, only 16 are published because their process of going through each study and judging its worth can take months, even years. It's not just nature that does this. On cell, for instance, you've got a team of you know, 12, 13 editors working on the journal. They will go through them and make an initial assessment, first of all, but after that, all of the papers are assigned to a specific scientific editor who will read them really carefully. The decision at this point, when it's been submitted, is if what this paper says is true, could it be a good fit for what um, Cell might want to publish? If the answer to that question is yes, then they'll send it out for in-depth peer review. It's time-consuming, and for researchers, it's grueling. But it means that papers in these journals have been seen by numerous experts and have gone through numerous revisions, what's called a peer review. If a paper is non-peer reviewed or are preprints like those on this website, it means that it might not have gone through this rigorous process, and the conclusions in that paper may not be reliable enough to trust. Even when a paper has been peer-reviewed, there can be issues. For instance, this paper on hydroxychloroquine, published in The Lancet in early 2020. 
a month after it came out, it was retracted because scientists who read it raised concerns about how accurate it was. This would usually happen before the paper was even published, but these aren't normal times for scientific research, particularly when lives are at stake. We're all trying to do everything we can to move the science forward and help us come to a solution. So we are working hard to make sure that the coronavirus papers get reviewed as quickly as possible and that we publish them as quickly as possible once they're, once they're ready. I and mean, we're not compromising our standards at all. The fact that scientists raised concerns about the paper and that the journal listened to them and retracted it means the scientific process is working. So let's go back to our original question. Why does scientific advice keep changing? Well, that is the scientific process. We find out something, we test it, we learn we were wrong and maybe why we were wrong, we try again and learn something new. This is why there was such a debate over whether or not face masks were effective. It's normal during the course of any development of a scientific topic that you publish papers that have different conclusions and then you come to some kind of a consensus as you get more evidence. To a large extent, it's the normal progress of science. Science can be messy, and the COVID-19 pandemic showed us how messy. But the debate around things like masks and hydroxychloroquine also shows us that the scientific process is working as it should. Science has to be messy because any process is. We ask questions, and in the process of finding answers, we end up asking even more questions. Science evolves. Science grows as, as new data come to light, new conclusions are made, or previous conclusions are revised, extended. We move with the science, as the scientists, as the researchers, collect more information. All of this is part and parcel of of doing science and disseminating science. So we're, we're no stranger to this, um, absolutely not. This is how science has always worked, and it's how it has to continue to work, especially when people's lives are on the line.